In 1996, Barbara Listinick was living in Fort Lauderdale, Florida with her constant companion, Boris. I got Boris when he was two years old. He is the most lovable dog in the whole wide world. He knows when I'm happy, he knows when I'm sad. He's a very big part of my life. I don't have children, I'm not married, so he's like my child and my best friend. Just before Christmas, Barbara made arrangements to move to Brooklyn, New York by renting a moving van, but decided to send Boris via air freight to spare him the long drive. Boris had never flown before, so I was very scared. I did everything that I thought was necessary for safe travels and what the airline recommended as well. That included removing Boris's identification collar so that it wouldn't get snagged during the flight. With that done, Boris was sent on his way. My thoughts when Boris was in the air were, please, please, please let him get here safely. But when she arrived at LaGuardia Airport to pick him up, her fears became reality. They took me in back and they said, okay, miss, there's a little bit of a problem. There was an accident. Then he walks me up to a bloody, crunched up, empty carrier. Oh my God, what did you people do? Oh my God, where is he? Under control. Where is he? Where's Boris? I knew that they dropped him or drove something into him. And my immediate thoughts were like, my God, is he alive or dead? I just, I just froze. I started shaking, I'm crying. And I'm like, my God, what, what happened? Where is he? Where's Boris? Spotted him on the tarmac. The supervisor told me that Boris had been running around on the tarmac and they have their cargo crew personnel chasing him right now. I said, you're never gonna get him. I said, he's, he's scared to death. I said, that's crazy. I said, just let me go out there, one whistle, and he'll come running to me. Why? Please, the supervisor me insisted that they had the situation under control. And for the next two hours, Barbara waited anxiously for some word of her injured dog. The supervisor finally came back out. The last we've seen him, he was running through the tarmac, and it seems that he's crossed the fence over the highway. He was seen running over the overpass and into Corona, Queens. And I just got in the car and just started searching for him immediately. Idiot. Boris was lost somewhere on the eastern edge of Manhattan. And if Barbara didn't locate him quickly, he could end up anywhere in New York City. He's never been in a noisy street. He's never been in New York City. He got dropped like a needle in a haystack At first, I was looking for his body. And then some kids said they saw this dog that was tan and white, and he was running like a bullet. And I said, oh, that gave me hope. I said, he's alive. Alive, but lost in one of the largest cities in the world. Boris, come here. Searching all night in the rain, in the cold, up and down the streets, calling out his name. On Christmas Eve, I really realize that, okay, <laughs> I'm like this little, little speck of dust in this big city looking for a lost dog. I know he's out there. Please come on. And I never felt so alone in my entire life, and I didn't know what to do. The next morning, Barbara returned to the airport. You lost my dog. Christmas Day, I go to the supervisor, and I said, okay, we have a situation. What are we going to do about this? You lost my dog. Yes, Mr. Listernick, I'm filling out the form now. And he just reached under the desk and pulled out a baggage claim form and said, this is all that we can do. This is a baggage claim form. I'm sorry, ma'am. Are you telling me my dog is baggage? I, I almost collapsed. My dog is considered baggage? I never knew in a million years that animals were considered luggage and that the law hasn't been changed since 1929. I said, this is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my entire life. My, my dog's not a piece of luggage. He's my baby. He's like my child. Sorry, Mr. <laughs> Immediately, I ran home and went through my boxes to find pictures of Boris, and I tore out my fax machine and just started running off flyers. 
She spent the rest of Christmas Day putting up missing dog posters throughout Corona, Queens. That night, Barbara returned home even more exhausted and depressed. How could she possibly celebrate Christmas under these circumstances? I said, I'm not going to light this tree until he's found, and I'm going to keep this tree until he's found. And this tree is not going anywhere until he's found, and it will be lit when I find him. After spending Christmas Day searching for her lost dog, Barbara Listenick realized that the job was too big for just one person. And so she tried a different approach. What's the best way to get the word out that Boris is lost? And I said, okay, let me call, let me call a newspaper. New York Post. Hi, my name is Barbara Listenick. And she found a sympathetic ear in reporter Laura Italiano. Barbara called the New York Post absolutely frantic. Typically, we're busy chasing murders, political corruption. It took a special kind of story for us uh, to get us to care about a little lost dog. And uh, Barbara was the one who made that happen for us. All right, I'll look forward to it. Good. All right. Bye -bye. It turned out that the New York Post loved the Boris story. He is a classic tabloid story. You have a clear-cut villain, this bungling airline, with a very sympathetic victim, a poor dog who had been lost. I think everyone's heart went out to Barbara. This is a woman who did not know New York City, knew no one in town, had this tremendous responsibility to find an animal in completely unfamiliar surroundings. You had to feel for her. You had to worry about her. I couldn't believe how many people responded. I mean, it touched so many people's hearts. We get more now from New York One's Annika Pergamon. Annika? One of those hearts belonged to Paula Forrester, a professional psychic who saw Boris's picture on a television news program. Eve on a flight from Fort Lauderdale. That Port Authority police said that the canine escaped. They did a close-up on his eyes, and there was like, pow! There was a psychic connection. I have worked psychically with animals before. I have never felt such a strong and urgent connection to anything before that point. Paula immediately contacted Barbara. Hello? And she said that she was a psychic. A psychic? And she said that she was getting strong feelings from him and that they were communicating. Well, my first reaction was, was, hey, lady, heck, you're communicating with my dog. Tell him to come home. But I said, look, I don't want a reward. I don't want pay. I just want to get Boris back to you. OK. I, I didn't believe in it, the hocus pocus type stuff. But hey, I just wanted my baby home. I'd love you to come and help. I wasn't going to turn away any volunteers to help find him. OK, and, and it's Paula? OK, great. Thanks a lot. Paula turned out to be more than just a volunteer. She was a force to be reckoned with. She was really, like, doing the legwork, really going out there, getting the flyers out. She was pushing me, and I thought I was the aggressive one. She was like, come on, let's go. You can do it. You can do it. Keep going. Keep going. I knew her dog was alive, and I knew he was desperate to find Barbara again. He was very, very confused and very, very sad. Every time I linked in psychically to Boris, the sadness confusion and the heartache was overwhelming. Boris! Here, boy! Boris! Here, boy! Come on, Boris! Going from neighborhood to neighborhood, we just kept looking every night in the cold. We just never stopped. Never stopped. What kept me going was this little dog that had a really big psychic voice that said, please help me. But after days of searching, Barbara's hopes began to fade. New Year's had come and gone, and it was so cold. With the wind chill factor, it was like something insane, like 25 below zero. And all I could do was cry. I just said, how is he surviving? 
family and friends were calling and saying, Barbara, you have to get on with your life. This is crazy, you know? And some people, oh, it's only a dog. You know, get over it, Barbara, get another one. Yeah. And, and I'm like, you don't understand. You don't understand, there's no closure. I can't live my life knowing that he's out there, he's cold, he's hungry, he's starving. I, I just say, I said, I'm not gonna give up on him. The hunt is on for a dog that escaped from its cage at Lamont. And the media was standing by Barbara's decision. The number that you can call if you have seen him, the number is 1-800. We started running a story a week in the New York Post and Barbara kept us well fed with updates. She felt that if the newspaper kept up a steady drumbeat to search for this dog, that uh, that public attention wouldn't just die down and he wouldn't die out there um, really unmourned, unsearched for. He has freckles all on his chest. But all the publicity only produced more false leads. Someone would say, oh, we found a stray, and deep inside I'm like, oh, please, just let it be him. Just let it be him. Please, 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 you know, let, let this misery stop for me. Or if I get a call that it was a dead dog on the side of the road, you know, that's tan and white, I'd go there and then I'd be, oh, God, thank you, thank you. It's not him. It's not him, you know. It was such an emotional roller coaster. I don't know how sometimes I kept going. You know, I was just physically and emotionally exhausted. Luckily, Barbara had Paula Forrester to help keep her spirits up. Her energy just kept me going, and really, it was a godsend that she did come along. The worst thing you can do is get discouraged. I know he's out there. Don't give up. I don't care if it takes two months. I don't care if it takes three months. Your dog is coming home. Alive. <laughs> It's been several weeks since a dog named Boris was lost in New York City. And all the efforts of the public and the media have been unable to produce a single solid lead. But a strange recurring dream is about to change the perimeters of the search. I would dream of Boris in the middle of the night and I would get images of tires, of the dog sleeping in a tire, of him having a bloody foot, of him starving, of him being very cold. And I knew that I was picking up what the dog was feeling. The dog was freezing. And that was very disturbing to me because I knew how desperate he was. The dream eventually led Paula to an automotive shop in Queens. I must have driven by this one auto repair place that had tires everywhere, that had windshields, that did body repair. I must have driven by it a hundred times. I actually went up and approached one of the workers there. Excuse me, sir. Have you seen this dog? Uh, one ear up, one ear down. He's brown and white. He might look like a stray by now. No, I haven't. He there's, might be like running around here somewhere. There's a lot of strays around here, lady. I'm pretty he, busy. The man was so busy. He just really kind of brushed me off. It seemed like just another dead end. Unfortunately, at this point, the media was also beginning to question its involvement in the search. Maybe we're doing the wrong thing in keeping this story going because the longer time that it had passed, the less likely of a happy ending in this story. When do you say when? When do you say it's enough, give up? I was had to make a decision whether to keep going on with this endless search or get on with my life. It was really getting to the point where, okay, reality started checking in with me. And I said, Barbara, if you give up, this dog's gonna give up and die because the only reason he's staying alive is because he knows you're out there looking for him. After weeks and weeks of searching, Paula received a tip on yet another sighting of Boris. I received a call at my apartment from a man in Queens who said, I think I have the dog that's in the flyer. He says, there's been this stray dog living in this garbage-filled, abandoned lot next to my house. Sometimes we throw leftovers over the fence because we feel sorry for this stray dog. And it kind of looks like the picture. The call brought Paula back to a familiar location. The man's apartment was next door to the automotive shop she'd visited days before. The man had let him in the house. Walked into his house, looked at the dog, Pictures, looked at the dog, 
his eyes were like soulless. They were dead. They were like a lost soul. He was filthy. He was a different color. He had a slash in his foot almost all the way through. Walked up to him and said, Boris, is that you? And then one ear went up, one ear went down, and I'm like, oh my God, it's Boris after 52 days. Her hands shaking, Paula immediately called Barbara. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Hello? I said, Barbara, we have Boris. She's like, it's not my dog. I've, I, you know, I can't go and look at any more dogs. Paula, are you sure, Tim? I'm so tired. I, I don't know how much I can take. Are you sure? Somebody called me. He's inside a house. This is definitely your dog. You have got to come down here now. Paula, I can't go through this. Don't... Barbara, there was not one ounce of, of energy left in me to do anything. I was like, God, what, well, you, it, it's not him. It can't be him. Look, I'm telling you, one ear up, one ear down. You've got to come down here. It's only a mile from the airport. Okay, I'm on my way. Weeks of sorrow and worry were about to come to an end. Come on, come on. Paul, you sure it's him? I'm so tired. Hi, girls. I go inside this apartment complex. Then there's this little, like, dog coming around the corner, peeking its head out at me. And I looked and I said, that's not my dog. I'm like... Boris is, you know, he's got beautiful eyes. He's got a tan fur jacket, you know, coat. He's beautiful. I said, this dog's skinny, and look at him. Oh, Boris. Barbara, Come look here. at him. And I said, Barbara, please, just look again. And I'm like, Boris? Boris, is that you? And then he looks up with his one ear up and one ear down. And I just was, I was like, oh, my God. Thank you. I'm shaking all over, and my legs gave out. I'm crying. Boris is looking at my face. I'm looking at everybody else in the room is crying. It was the most beautiful thing. It was worth every minute of whatever I contributed as a part of this bigger picture. It was the best reward and the most miraculous reward. That was a miracle. It was a chance in a billion. I believe it's you. Oh, I know you're so tired and scared. Oh, my God. Oh, look at his face, baby. Okay, Boris, the moment we've been waiting for. That night, Barbara kept her promise. After weeks of waiting, her Christmas tree was finally lit to welcome Boris home. On, we'll make it all better. Yeah, look at the pretty tree. We can finally light it because you're home. You're home, baby. The next morning, a triumphant New York Post headline greeted all of New York City, and Boris immediately became a media darling. But after six weeks of street life, the mixed breed boxer is finally home. He's a trooper. He's, he, he held in there. I can't believe it. All the while, his owner kept the faith. But it was a little magic that brought him home. And Paula Forrester helped provide some of that magic. She and Barbara continue to be close friends, and today, Barbara is far less skeptical of psychic phenomena. Wonderful, good boy. <laughs> He's just like sitting on you, huh? <laughs> okay, I'm a believer. There, there are some powers out there that you, know, you can't dismiss. Oh, are you boy. Our chances, psychically or otherwise, were one in a billion. I could have been totally wrong through this whole thing. It was a miracle that Boris was found. Find a lost dog in New York City, anything could happen. Anything. For me to be reunited with him is total, total a miracle to me. Totally.